This is 4605, A Global History of Architecture. Uh, my name is Robert Cowherd, and as your professor, I need to point out one thing. I am number four. Now, you're not going to know what that means until we get into the course. So let's get into the course. I'm going to start the course in two alternative ways. Your job is to pay attention to what happens and compare the two different ways we start the course. Um, so here's the first way. Notice what happens to you. Don't, it's really about what happens to you. So the first way we start the course is the way it was started the three times I sat in this room uh, as either a student or a TA uh, taking this course over the past 20 years. Um, the first way is, well, I'm going to do it a little differently. I'm going to, since I'm under the influence of the big history movement, I'm going to start in a big history way. And this is first and foremost a history course. And it's a history course taught through the evidence of architecture, which is the first way that everything changes in this course that makes it very different from other history of architecture courses. So here we go, the alternative one a big history course through the evidence of architecture. 13.8 uh, billion years ago, the space and time came into being in the Big Bang. And it wasn't until 4 billion years ago that the Earth formed. And 1 billion years after that, humanity, or life came. And it wasn't until about 20,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago, sorry about my mistakes, um, about 200,000 years ago that the modern humans uh, came into being. The history of architecture uh, begins arguably 100,000 years ago where we have the first evidence from Blombo's Caves in, in South Africa of human artifacts that are a reflection, that are available for our examination as evidence into clues as to how society uh, at that time functioned. Okay, that's the first alternative beginning. Did you see what happened there? Do you notice that? Um, the second way is to not start 13.8 billion years ago. The second way is to start right here, right now, and take as the first topic of this course the thing that we all share in common. Uh, what do we all share in common? What experience have we all shared? Life in the 21st century. Life in the 21st century. Something more specific than that. MIT. MIT. Something more specific than that. 4605. 4605. Mm -hmm. What about the architecture of 4.605? This room. So the second way to start this course is right here, right now, with this architecture that we all have in front of us. Now the thing about this room, well, what is it about this room? How does this room, uh, how do we evaluate it historically? What does the architecture mean? Any clues? What do we look at? figure out what's what's going on here with this room. Yeah. The materials, the fabrication process. The materials, the fabrication process tells us a lot, right? These are industrially produced materials. How did they get here? How did these materials get here in this form? And what does that tell us? What might that say to us about what's going on here? Because remember, we're trying to figure out what's up with this. What's going on here? So, uh, so let's do that. This is the second way. Now, so there's two alternative approaches. One is going way back in time, far, far away, long, long ago, to something that none of us have experienced directly. The second approach is to start right here, right now. What happens to you? What happened to you when I went back to the Big Bang? 
Did you notice something? This is why I practice medicine and teaching. What happened to you when I went way back? Got a little sleepy? Couldn't connect? But you still were compelled to connect. By what? You can answer. I'm paying attention. I'm just... How does that? Yeah, you have a commitment to the narrative of history. That's why you're here. You're, you've made at least a tentative commitment to the narrative of history. You got to take a class. Eh, I've always liked architecture. Sure, why not? But is that enough to get us through this semester? Taking notes, repeating it back on the test the way I did. I was really good at it. That's how I got here. That makes me the least qualified person to teach because I was so good at that. I don't understand what it's like to do it any other way. But I'm compelled by knowing what I know to try to do it differently. What happened when I started asking you questions and then stood here silently waiting? That was different from when I started with the Big Bang. You're thinking and not listening? Well, I hope you're listening and thinking. I don't know. Maybe that's too much to ask. But that's what we're going for. So I've made um, some commitments to myself and to you, and I will continue to make some commitments in the way I've structured the course. Uh, and I, what I hope will happen is that you will see me as number four. Ah, there he goes again with that number four thing. What does he mean by that? So what do I mean by that? Why do I have to say that? Well, let's look at this room. Um, how annoying is that shimmering of the screen? I'll try to have that fixed for next time. So um, the underlying history, the underlying question that, uh, behind all history, although historians, we don't like to admit it because it is so here and now, and we're uncomfortable with here and now, that's why we're historians. But let's face it, the underlying uh, fundamental question of history is now what? This happened in the past, now what? This is our understanding of things, so what now? What do we do now? This also, not coincidentally, is the underlying question facing every human alive today, and we'll get into why that is. Um, so here we are, and we, in, we interrogate, in history of architecture, we interrogate sites. I'm saying site, uh, when I say site, and when I say architecture, I mean built stuff, physical stuff, like this lecture hall. And uh, so we interrogate buildings, we interrogate uh, buildings that have been elevated to the status of venerated architecture, but we also uh, deal with other material, objects of material culture, uh, landscapes, cities, infrastructures, uh, objects, especially when they uh, uh, operate in, in the influence of big forces. So ultimately, when we're trying to figure out intelligent responses to the question, what now, we, we go to the evidence and we try to figure out what's up with that. We try to figure out 
what's going on. We interrogate the evidence. And so let's interrogate this evidence together. Uh, here we have this hall. There's the material, physical uh, character of it, materiality. Now, what about the shape? What's going on with the shape? The shape of this room. What does it do? Yeah, don't raise your hand, just say it. Brings your focus to the front. And what happened, you know, so, so it brings your focus to the front. There's, there's a hierarchy. There's a relationship. What is that relationship? Professor-student. Professor-student. And what do we know about that relationship because we've been in school for most of our lives? Student is student pays attention to professor. So the room is telling you, student, pay attention to the professor. The professor is number one. The message is clear. The architecture is reinforcing behaviors. There is a relationship between your life experience and the shape of this room. And those two things work together. You walk into this room, you're not surprised. This is a lecture, a lecture course. Uh, the students focus on the, the lecturer. The word lecture, does, where does that come from, that word lecture? Some of you have studied foreign languages. Romance languages. Lecture. Lair is the last language I learned in Spanish. To read. Do you know what the history of, of the lecture hall is? It was invented uh, prior to the printing press. It was a very efficient way to reproduce notes to reproduce, to basically publish, to self-publish. The lecturer literally is called a lecturer because he or she, usually he, used to read and the students would write down faithfully every word that the lecturer lectured. And it, but then something happened. The technology of printing came into being and how did that transform the educational system that dominated society? Not much. The lecture course survived. Now we have the internet. And what happened to the lecture course? It changed completely, right? No. The shape of the room changed totally. No. It's the same. What's up with that? What is going on here? It used to be and you've experienced it. Um, we assume you are empty vessels to be filled up with the information produced and, and offered from the lecture. We don't have an information problem anymore. If we had time, I would give you an exercise. I would say, okay, someone pick uh, a year long time ago. Okay, 838. Okay, someone else pick a place that you're very unfamiliar with. Okay, Tasmania. Okay, now everybody with your computers, look up Tasmania 838, um, tell us something about it. Boom! Two minutes, flooded with information. Information is no longer a problem, or it's not the same problem it was before. Now it's a problem of too much information. You don't need me to tell you what I'm about to say because you already know it. You don't need me to fill you up with information. You are the world's foremost experts on your own life experience. You are not empty vessels. You come into this room as experts. I want you to stay in this room and engage as experts. And I want you to leave here more expert, not convinced that you are less expert. So we start with MIT because that's what we know. And by starting with MIT, 
I can be liberated from the number one, the fallacy, the fantasy, the mistake, the crime of pretending to be the only expert in the room. And instead, we can talk about MIT. Now, we still have this hall. We still have uh, 80 minutes, at least that's what I was told, um, to get through an awful lot of stuff. So we still have a lot of limitations. I apologize. I'm still going to be talking a lot. I'm still going to be presenting a lot of information. But I'm going to try to do it. This is one of my many commitments to you. I'm going to try to do it in a way that doesn't assume that you're helpless in terms of getting this information. I'm trying to proceed, and I want you to join me in this, as if you weren't empty vessels to be filled, as if you are already experts on an awful lot of stuff. I mean, many of you could explain to me the first few moments after the Big Bang much better than I could ever understand it. So uh, if we, even if we started at the beginning, this would be true. But we're going to try to build on your expertise. That is the commitment. We start with your expertise, and we build on it. And so you are experts uh, on how, what it took to get into this room. You are experts on what it's like to be at MIT. Uh, and you have already experienced this architecture. Um, and so we're going to use it to look at the what, um, and now I'm going to start, I'm going to tell you something you don't know. Um, I'm going to tell you about Nelson Goodman's 1988 uh, piece called How Buildings Mean. And in 1988, Nelson Goodman published this, and he covers four distinct mechanisms of how buildings mean. The first way, he says, is through denotation. The first source of meaning of a, of a piece of architecture, according to Nelson Goodman, is it's written right on the building. The meaning is written, engraved in the building. And I don't agree with the way he structured it and the way he expressed it completely, but um, I don't want to erase his contributions totally and, and displace it with my own. So I'm going to try to work as best I can with Goodman's four, four methods. So there's the first one, denotation. The writing is on the wall. And you've seen this, and um, it's pretty clear what the architecture is trying to say. It's trying, there's a long progression of human history and the growth of the sciences and rationality since the Enlightenment, and we all stand on the shoulders of those who came before. Great. The second way is by metaphor. What does this architecture mean? And I hear from the bell on my phone that I should be moving to the second topic. So the long pauses, I love the long pauses. But um, you know, you, you know what, you, your brains are all working. So just spit it out. Don't raise your hand unless someone else is already talking, which I hope happens early and often. So what does that mean? Blur to that. Help me out. Put me in my place. Put me at number four. Very sacred. Right? Sacred, and why would it be important to give that feeling? And, and you can say why that's important or how they do it. Yeah, so they, there's an allusion to sacred, identifiably sacred architecture. But then there's a second thing. There is a physics, right? This is what you're comfortable with physics, right? There's an optics at work here. There's a focal point, and there's this 
perspective, the operation of perspective in this space. It's like it's a machine. It's like this architecture is a machine doing this physics thing. You see that? So in Goodman's terms, those are two distinct operations. One is what he calls metaphorical expression. Yeah, metaphorical expression. I think it's bigger than that. I think it takes in all received knowledge. You either, you know, as a child, you went to the bank and it looked like this, and so you got this sense of, whoa, this is important, sacred, money, the temple of money. Or, or you learned about, maybe you learned something about history, you learned about historical forms, you might even know that that's a replica of the Dome of Pantheon. But if you know that or not, there is this category of received knowledge. Then there's a second thing, and, and part of the received knowledge, let's go into the received knowledge a little bit. The original design is very much influenced by Thomas Jefferson, he'll come up in this course again, uh, his design for the University of Virginia as an academic village where each structure on the quad uh, represented a different uh, study uh, and housed the quarters of a distinct uh, master professor uh, with another replica of the Pantheon at the center. So a very powerful and very direct example of received knowledge and metaphor. And multiple designs in uh, at the beginning of the century when MIT decided to move from Boston, its Boston campus to Cambridge and it refused Harvard's offer to become incorporated into Harvard. Uh, Ed, created its own site on landfill that we'll have a picture of uh, on the Charles River. And multiple designs came up right away. Um, they first tried to do it without an architect because the culture of MIT is architect architect. We can do it better than any architect. Um, and so then the architects got involved and they came up with multiple versions of a similar aesthetic approach. Refer to classical architecture to ennoble the activity that occurs within. To ennoble the activity that occurs within. So it's already intentionally trying to alter the experience of all students and faculty who follow. Uh, so a hundred years ago, they were talking about very explicitly how to refer to received knowledge, the metaphor. Here's uh, the library in Building 4. You've all been there. It used to be very different um, than it is now, uh, but it's the interior of the Pantheon that, um, that we will see again throughout the course. And here's how they did it. Um, they used very advanced uh, technologies, the building technologies that are available today, not the building technologies of the Pantheon. Uh, re steel reinforced concrete, uh, steel elements, uh, in order to replicate something that was built in stone and concrete uh, uh, 2,000 years earlier. So the third thing that um, we heard about was uh, the physics of the optics. And so this is uh, Nelson Goodman's third category, which he calls exemplification. Great term. We're going to use it. Exemplification. You don't have to know anything. You could come from Mars, arrive in Killian Court, and if you have eyes, especially if you have two eyes and you still experience the uh, physics of light in the same way humans do, you will experience that physiological, physical uh, operation of the architecture to focus your view. The other way exemplification works, not just through the eye, although in architecture, especially in architecture history, we tend to privilege the eye in its operation. And we will do that. But we will also, we won't stop there, we'll also talk about the exemplification of, back to the lecture hall, of what it's like to physically organize bodies in space in specific ways. What it's like to move through space through the system of circulation that organizes the relationship of the different courses, course 4, course 11, course 5, course 1, whatever those numbers mean, they are organized in a neutral grid. This is a classical facade 
which is the costume on hanging on a very modern building in terms of its building construction technology and its organization. This organization, this is not what was built, but what was built was profoundly uh, influenced by this proposal. Taylorism. What is Taylorism? You've studied it, I think. Yes, I've studied it. No, I haven't studied it. Yes, I've studied it. Taylorism? Okay, Taylorism is uh, uh, the rational scientific study of efficiency, of human efficiency, uh, which is the basis of mass production and the factory system. And so this uh, building layout was very much influenced by rational scientific principles of uh, human engage engagement and endeavors, uh, and also flexibility. It's like a factory. This is a flexible layout, and you can change the partitions in a way that allows for different configurations and accommodates all kinds of different laboratory spaces. This building that we're in has proven to be remarkably flexible. And that's why you can fit a lecture hall because the, the floor to floor height is something like 20 feet. So you can do all kinds of things, including putting mezzanine levels. Uh, it turns out to be the basis of factories. Now the lofts of uh, the service sector, creative sector economy, um, it's been working great. And so here we see the modern building construction technology upon which the costume of classical uh, the vocabulary of the message, the outward visual message, uh, hangs. And uh, here we see it in juxtaposition. The outward appearance with the statue of Minerva and the um, highly rational, modern, uh, sophisticated technological frame system, open, flexible, all of these characteristics. Um, the fourth and final ways that buildings mean according to Goodman, is what he calls mediated reference. Uh, let's call it history. Stuff happens. Uh, Ford's Theater, the only reason you know about Ford's Theater is because Lincoln was shot there. There's nothing special about the architecture. Stuff happens. The World Trade Center, something we will look at in this course, uh, meant one thing before it was built, it meant another thing after it was built, and it means something totally different now, which hopefully will be where it stops, but this will never mean uh, anything more profoundly than 9-11 uh, tax. So history happens. Here's the landfill on the Charles River. That's Mass Ave. Um, our lecture hall is off the frame a little bit to the left. <clears throat> Building 20, uh, is important because of the history that occurred there. The invention of the radar, which uh, my father studied radar technology in, in the 1940s before going off in World War II. Uh, and it's credited as being the invention that changed the world, um, presumably because we won the war. Um, I think it's not that simple. But still, people have a profound veneration for Building 20 but not enough to save it from um, the demolition uh, as what happened. So the history of MIT is intertwined with the history of Cambridge. Uh, urban renewal is something we'll be talking about. Um, this area was cleared for what reason? Anyone know? Why was Kendall Square demolished? Yes. NASA. NASA. Uh, this was supposed to be Houston. <clears throat> mission control for the space program. But Kennedy got assassinated. Johnson relocated it to Houston. Um, Building 20 was very important, but it was uh, destined for the wrecking ball. But when Frank Gehry uh, was given the assignment to replace Building 20, he was told, we need the same kind of mixing of diverse ecologies of different fields of study. We had linguistics and radar technology and brain science and uh, really 
a hundred or more different disciplines went through building 20 and every time the mix changed it led to remarkable uh, innovations that nobody expected because the tradition in the 20th century is to separate and isolate and so people can really focus on what they're doing but the surprise experiment that building 20 created was what happens when you mix things up and so uh, the whole idea of this is to not have an infinite corridor uh, that we've all experienced. What's it like to walk down the infinite corridor? You are experts in walking down the infinite corridor. What's wrong with the infinite corridor? Yeah, don't slow down. You'll get stomped on. Right? So this is the opposite. This is the student street. Do you see it there in the middle? It's full of meanders. It is a village uh, to counter the infinite corridor's superhighway. And so, um, so the form, just to, you know, to finally close the first part of this, MIT, uh, because we're my, one of the structures I've committed to is four per class meeting, four sites and four systems. So the site is MIT, the system is education, and how education is facilitated by architecture. Um, all kinds of things are written on walls here, some of it permanent, some of it temporary. Uh, that's, a, that's denotation. The metaphor, uh, there's all kinds of allusions to informal settlements, another topic of the course uh, that we get to next. Um, so that's the, the metaphor. Um, the exemplification is, is the one that we're, we love the most. Is buildings mean what they mean because they do what they do. And that is one of the radical, believe it or not, departures from conventional uh, history of architecture that we are committing to. Not just uh, replicating what architects and clients say about their building, but take into consideration what they actually do. How do they work? What larger forces are put into play through the architecture? Uh, what we are doing here is every building we look at is to be considered first and foremost as a machine for doing something. Buildings are expensive, really expensive. I'm not going to pay for a building if it's just going to mean something, if it's just going to be a symbol. Sure, if I have an extra billion dollars to play with, I might do that. But even then, I want it to do more than just symbolize something. I want it to change things. I want it to do something. I want it to operate. This room operates very powerfully to say, number one, filling the empty vessels and um, Based on that evaluation, we are obligated to do it differently. Why? Because it hasn't worked out so well. Producing replicants through the education system has been remarkably successful, and that was the goal back in the Industrial Revolution. You want replicants. You want dependability in a large group of people who can predictably operate as, as they were prepared to operate. And that was beautiful, and it worked beautifully, and it's the result, it resulted in all kinds of fantastic things. But there were some unintended consequences of that that you guys have to deal with, and I'm sorry. The, uh, those of us from an older generation, um, we didn't really catch on fast enough, but now, Replicants don't, don't cut it. We can't afford to have uh, students graduating from programs that aren't actively engaged. Passive the day of the passive student, hopefully, is quickly ending. We need active agents for change. And so uh, that's part of what happens at the core of this course. So having looked at MIT, something that you are experts on, 
we are not now, we could, I could have decided, well, okay, now we've, I've reinforced the expertise of the group. Now we can go back to the Big Bang, we can do some caves, do some temples, do the pyramids, and because you're all experts now. No. We're going to keep it the beginning point now. The next topic is, again, a topic that's here and now today. Uh, and we're going to do the whole course backwards. Is that okay? This is going to do it backwards. You know who? Who's the guy on Seinfeld? George. Come on, this is popular culture. What's George Costanza? What's the George Costanza thing? George Costanza Day. What is I don't even watch the show. You guys have seen it, right? Seinfeld? Is that already old? George Costanza, he did, nothing ever worked for him when he was trying so hard. So he decided to just do it the opposite. Whatever he thinks he should do, he's just going to do the opposite. So this whole education thing has not turned out so well for the world. So let's do the opposite. Let's teach history backwards and see what happens. I'd be interested to know if anyone's done this before. I'm not aware of it. Um, but we're going to find out what happens. Because we're not going to the pyramids. We're going to Dubai. So each of these towers is taller than the tallest building in Boston. Um, what do we know about skyscrapers? Are they the most efficient way to do things? Land is so expensive that you can't afford to build a one-story building, you've got to build up. At what point does that not make sense? Economics of elevator course. When the land is cheaper than the building. Right. When the land is cheap, you can't, you know, it doesn't justify the cost because the higher you go, the more expensive it is per square foot because you've got to hold it up. The columns get fatter. And the big thing that limit has limited in the past is not just structure, but also what? The elevators. The more floors, the more constrained the elevators are. If the, the bottom floor of the old World Trade Center was nothing but elevators. All elevators all the time. And so you get to the first floor, how much rentable, leasable space is there? <clears throat> not much. So there is an economics of skyscraper building that limits how high you go. So what's up with this? Is there really so much demand in Dubai that you can afford to have all these skyscrapers taller than anything in Boston? It's hard to justify. Is there really so much demand? There aren't really many uh, people who live in Dubai who aren't construction workers. So if this is already confusing, what's up with, with that? What's going on? We're not, even, we're not even halfway up here. This thing just, boom. Is it a symbol? Easy. Is it a symbol? Yeah. Is it just a symbol, or does it do something else? Well, it better do something else, because this is really expensive. I mean, there's the... I don't know what we're familiar with. I don't know where everyone's from. But somewhere in here is the Empire State Building. It's one of the short ones. This is so much bigger. There it is, Empire State Building. This is so much bigger that when they announced this, I said, well, that's it. No one's ever going to build higher than this. But there's two, at least two already in construction that are going higher than this. What is up with that? How do they do it? Well, how do they do it is a really interesting thing if you're an engineer. Um, but we don't have time. It's very interesting. But what is going on? And I'm going to move through this much more quickly than I planned. Um, lots of great stories um, behind this. But here's a clue. The opening of uh, the Burj Khalifa, well, that's part of the story. The, it was originally called the Burj Dubai. 
but they ran out of money and they had to be uh, uh, saved by uh, their friend over in Abu Dhabi uh, who got the building to be named after him. So now it's the Burj Khalifa. And the, um, the question that I asked a bit earlier is, is there really so much demand to justify this? And the immediate answer, the superficial answer is, well, it's totally sold. Every floor, every bit of space has been sold. So obviously there is demand. Okay, but an intelligent follow-up question is, well, how many people use that space? And the answer is, well, what do you mean by use? Now we're getting somewhere. What is the use of all this space? It turns out that this space is empty for the most part. The occupancy rate is very low. The ownership rate, 100%. Occupancy rate, less than half and will be for a long time to come. So what's going on? The answer, to just quickly move along, because we've got still a lot of stuff to cover, is it's an investment. It's a very good investment. It's going to hold its value. How do we know it's going to hold its value? <laughs> Look at it. Every New Year's Eve, we remind the world just how awesome this building is and how important it is and how it's the new center of, well, it's not the capital of the world, but we're working on it. So the way investment works is you need something real. You can invest in stocks. You can invest in all kinds of things. But at some point, it's got to relate somehow to something real that's useful that will have value 20 to 30 years from now or 10 to 20 years from now. And so the thirst for value, the necessity of something dependably holding its value is the reason why a lot of real estate in the Boston area is being bought up by the Saudi princes, by wealthy people in Malaysia, Indonesia, China. There's a lot of real estate in the Boston area owned by people who don't live here. And they own it because they need some place dependable to park their investment value. This is what drives Dubai. Uh, and the invention of something called sovereign wealth funds is the only way you can account for this architecture. And so here's a site and a situation. And a spectacle that it all you try to make sense of it it doesn't stop it doesn't start and end with the architecture itself this is not an aesthetic study of facades and expression of culture this is about what the building does it makes a great platform for pyrotechnics it makes it's really good at uh, being this focal point of global spectacle and all of that makes it excellent for holding investment value. It doesn't have to actually be useful 10 years from now. It just has to be a plausible, a credible focal point of the story that today someone believes that it'll be worth uh, as much or much more 10 years from now. And as long as that story is plausible and the evidence of the architecture and the uh, spectacle around the architecture, uh, as long as that is plausible, then it is doing its job. They originally designed it as totally residential, but then they switched it. Okay, it's going to be offices and residential. Okay, it's going to have a hotel in it. Does it matter? It only matters to the extent that uh, one sector or another sector is capable of attracting investment uh, on a large scale. And so the desert that is Dubai quickly becomes the armature of some pretty remarkable architecture that we do not have time to go into. But along the way, here's an example of the kind of visual analysis that we will be doing. And when I say we, I mean you. Uh, the weekly exercises are not names and dates, although there's going to be lots of names and dates. Uh, the weekly exercises are to test your capacity for taking architectural evidence and using it to support a story. 
such as uh, the four stories that I'm telling today and will tell every lecture. Indoor ski area. Remarkable expression of Islamic uh, architectural <laughs> expression along with some Starbucks. Um, and then the other thing that happens historically is that a vast population of workers from other countries occupy these one-story areas of worker housing under extreme restrictions. If you don't show up on work uh, to work, um, you're out of the country. Um, we have your passport. You can't leave unless we say you can leave. Uh, when you want to, when, even if you want to stay, we tell you when it's time to leave and we deport you. It's not slavery, but it's not totally unrelated. So I'm not going to bother with this, but it's more of the same. How can architecture, and I love this video because they refer to, I mean, it's a very direct, yeah, okay. So you get it. Architecture does what it does in part because it pulls and draws on the received knowledge of what architecture has done in the past. And so we're going to move from the present to the past uh, keeping track of not just what the aesthetic facades and the visual uh, experience of architecture is, but the more total experience of architecture. Okay, I made up a little time. What else is important for uh, us here now today when we ask the question, now what? Right? I'm, I'm assuming that that's the question we all need to respond intelligently to. Um, so now what? Well, what's going on right now that could have an impact on what happens in the next century? Well, here are the slums. Um, we're gonna, there are slums all over the world. They seem to be concentrated in the global south, something we used to call the third world. But if we have time, I'll show you why that name is no longer relevant. But it's not all horrible. It's actually uh, not not bad in some places. How does this guy know? I lived in this neighborhood for four years, um, and these are my neighbors, and it was wonderful. Um, it wasn't all wonderful. Um, the four, the five categories, uh, the five characteristics of slums is defined by the UN, and I'm only using five, not their seven, because again, two of them are uh, a little uh, problematic. But the first one is lack of basic services. The second one is self-built housing. They built it themselves. The UN expresses it as uh, inadequate housing. Uh, but the assumption is that if someone builds their own house, you should demolish it and let a professional build it. That's becoming a little problematic as we look at um, the several approaches um, to alleviating these problems. Uh, the third thing is uh, lack of secure land rights. Uh, I'm not going to put a lot into building my house if I could be kicked out um, tomorrow. Um, so secure land rights turn out to be, in a way, the big one, that everything else gets fixed if you secure people's land rights. The next one is high density tends to be extremely high density because of the pressures. Um, let's leave it at those four. Those are the ones we really care about. Want to hear them again? Lack of basic services, including water. The biggest one is water supply, but also sewage. Second one, uh, self-built housing. Third one, lack of land rights, or weak land rights, and fourth one is high density. Those are the big ones. So, um, but one of the positive things about this is people run their own businesses. You know, she didn't have to rent a space. She just set it up in the alley. Really good food. Um, this is the way it looks. Um, you'll notice that when some people get together some money, they stay in the neighborhood and they just build their house. So uh, to the extent that people stick it out, and this is specific to Indonesia, um, uh, 
but it happens everywhere to a different extent. But Indonesia uh, gives us one of the clearest examples. Um, so people, when they get some money together, they stick it out, and there's a certain social coherence, cohesion, and obligation uh, to make sure your neighbors are not starving, to make sure the kids can go to school. These social relationships turn out to have remarkable economic benefits uh, that people know each other because they buy things from each other and they pass each other on these very narrow alleys called gong. So in the name of this uh, third site, it's gong two. That means the second alley of the Kabon Kachang neighborhood. Kabon Kachang means uh, bean fields. And uh, it's in the larger neighborhood of Tana Abang, one of the biggest markets in Jakarta. Um, and the key to this is these neighborhoods throughout the world tend to be located near uh, formal sector economic activity zones. So uh, a large part of the economies of the developing world are informal economies. I buy some pens and I sell them on the, on the overpass to business people. Uh, I buy lots of stuff and I sell them to my neighbors out, out of my, the front door of my home. Um, and so a lot of informal sector uh, activities uh, in economic activities occur in these informal settlements. And so this is together a social package, a social spatial package of informality. So again, there's the the material cultural evidence uh, of the architecture, but it, it, it's inseparable from the social relationships, the economic, the political, uh, all of these factors, the legal, are all intertwined. They don't separate out nice and neat and tidy the way we experience them in the United States for the most part. And so um, if we look at the visual evidence uh, of Tana Abang, we see lots of stuff in the streets. The streets uh, have not yet been taken over by automobiles. People still uh, dominate the streets. And so you can look at the distinct parcels um, that they don't own, but they have some land rights to. In the United States, we have fee simple ownership. Those of you who um, have purchased, you know all about that. Then there's rental, and then there's something that's neither one of those, which is condos. So three, that's three categories. Uh, in most of the rest of the world, there are dozens of different levels of land rights. I own the house, but I don't have rights to the land. Uh, I, don't have, I don't own the land, but I have a 99-year lease, or I, I pay taxes to the government based on the fact that I use this land but it's not the same as ownership. I don't know. It's foggy. So every piece of land is a mishmash of land rights, some of them more secure than others. Um, so this is, these are the shapes of the different activities and the kind of things that happen uh, include businesses. This is an example of a spatial analysis that uses storylines uh, to pull meaning out and try to figure out what's up with that, like what is going on here. Uh, the, what is the larger situation that goes beyond just the site and goes into something about a larger systemic forces? So the subtitle of this course, if I were to give it one, is Sites and Systems. And so we're looking at sites and we're using the evidence of that built material, physical, spatial, formal arrangement to understand something about the larger forces about the system itself. And here's the uh, diverse economic ecology of the different activities of different people. And uh, once you look at one site in this way, you understand uh, better how to read the physical fabric of this place, you can start to look at other places. One of the world's favorite places to look at is Dharavi, especially since um, What's the name of that movie that took place in Dharavi? Slumdog Millionaire, thank you. This is the place where Slumdog Millionaire took place. And the movie itself uh, is not just a movie. The, the people are not the only star. 
the fabric of that neighborhood is part of the story. And uh, just as Slumdog Millionaire doesn't work uh, without the role played by the physical environment, uh, such as it is in Dharavi, uh, the understanding of physical fabric doesn't work without the people and the struggles that they face. So there is, we're, we're not going to strive for a tidy separation of architecture and the world. They are intertwined. Our job is to embrace that intertwining and use them to help inform each other. You can't understand how systems work without understanding how the architecture works. You can't understand the architecture and how it works without understanding the systems. So we're going to do this very quickly because you're probably familiar with this. This is the population um, through most of uh, recorded uh, and unrecorded human history. It starts out around 10 million and stays that way forever until we get a little blip and by the Industrial Revolution, pow, we shoot up to 1 billion. Oh my God, what do we do? Thomas Malthus sends the alert. He says, listen, we got to start sterilizing poor people or else we're in big trouble because our ability to grow food increases arithmetically, but our need to consume food apparently expands exponentially. Um, and so I'm going to just, this is the same data, I'm just going to stretch it out just so you can see what happens next, otherwise it's invisible. Um, so we hit the first billion at the Industrial Revolution, pow, we snap up in a fraction of that time uh, to hit the second billion, third billion, fourth billion, fifth billion, sixth billion, every 12, 16 years or so, pow, we just click, click, click. Um, and where does it stop? <clears throat> it just keeps going, keeps, keeps going forever, right? Who knows? Does it keep going forever? No. What happens? Disease doesn't really make a dent. Yeah, here's, here's the black plague. Uh, you know, a little flattening out. You know, Europe schmurp, you know, it doesn't, doesn't register. Um, it's not disease. What is it? Not enough land, but then what happens? People kill each other? Not yet, not yet, and hopefully not. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to kill anybody. And this is what happens. Oh, it's flattening out. Oh, thank God, that was close. Whew! Turns out that as uh, societies move up the development spectrum and women get educated and access to birth control, but mostly women get empowered, we're all set. Everything's cool. Phew! So no problem, right? We can add another, we're at, we're at seven now, right? So we can add another three billion. Look, just empty seats. We can make room, <laughs> right? Well, maybe, maybe we can, maybe we can't. Here's what it looks like when it goes back to uh, arithmetic scale. This is unprecedented in human history. It is the wall, the demographic revolution. It happened in the blink of an eye, 10 million to 10 billion. So we better get ready. You know, a lot of things we read, it starts with, oh, China, urbanization. Oh, we're, gonna, we're facing in the next few years a global population of 8 billion. Get over it, right? 10 billion. It's already set. Well, they've revised their numbers. They say it could go anywhere up to 13, but... Um, but we won't dwell on that. But the, um, this is a more, more uh, appealing way to look at it. This was shown at the most recent Rio summit, and they talk about human population growth since um, the Industrial Revolution. It's the same data that I just showed. Um, I wish I knew they were going to do this. I wouldn't have bothered with all that work. But they also juxtapose it with the physical spatial arrangement, the infrastructures of our cities and towns, uh, the interconnectedness of the world, which is a central theme of the way we're doing this course. And it talks about how we have entered a historic moment, which we are now calling the Anthropocene. I don't know how to pronounce it. 
Anthropocene. Anthropocene. Have you heard about this? The Anthropocene. It is the first moment when a single species has uh, a dominant impact on the planet. And so uh, it really is a whole new world, literally, that we have to take into consideration our actions because the fate of the world depends on it more than ever before. When I was sitting in that seat, um, I was still under the delusion that the world was either going to go on or end, depending on whether one or the other of two old white men uh, decided to blow up the world. And so there's nothing we could do about it. So, you know, whatever. Party on. But now it's like paper or plastic. Um, uh, I don't know which paper or plastic. I, I don't know. The fate of the world depends on your answer to everything. Where do I buy my house? Does it allow me to drive to work? I mean, do I have to drive to work or does it allow me to have choices? So every choice will have an impact on this. So it's not the number of people, it turns out. It's the impact that each of those people has. If everyone in the world at 10 billion lived like we do in the United States, Forget it. It's not even close with given current technologies. There's no way. Um, but if everyone in the world lived the way people do, the average person in India lives, no problem. Let's go to 15 billion, 20 billion, 30 billion. We can handle 30 billion if we live differently than in the United States. Um, but it turns out that if you shrink the population, uh, part of that graph, and you now you, in order to fit on the impact of consumption, it looks like this. So that that wall of demographic looks tiny compared to the wall of impacts measured by consumption. And so, do you know who this guy is? Health are improving there. All the green Latin American countries, we are moving towards smaller families. The yellow. So this is Hans Rosling. He took. A the data, this is a TED Talk from 2006, one of the most popular TED Talks ever. He took all the data and he put it in uh, an open source database visualizer and where you can do stuff like this. He's basically the sportscaster of the race. Um, and this is why we no longer use the word third world. He's about to show us, and in, there's going to be a slow motion replay, so watch for that why we can no longer talk about the third world. Because things have um, broken up and things... The ones here are the Arabic countries and they get larger families, but they, no, longer life, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here, they still remain here. This is India, Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh, it's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The Imams start to promote family planning and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible <clears throat> HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. Here's the instant replay. Look at China. The size of the circle is the population difference. And so he goes on to talk about uh, the average per capita income per day and it moves very quickly uh, and will continue to move uh, upward. And so his general point is that things are getting better uh, and things are, and then, but then when he breaks it down, I'm going to go back. When he breaks it down by country, it turns out within each country, and he uses Africa, there is a huge discrepancy between the poorest 20% and the wealthiest 20%. And even within Africa, the poorest 20% in Sierra Leone and the wealthiest 20% in South Africa, that is the entire spectrum. And so there is no longer a spatial distribution of wealth and poverty that can be characterized as the first world and the third world. Every city, every nation contains the first world wealth and the third world poverty. 
And that is reflected in the architecture, and you can't really read the world without understanding some of these uh, discrepancies. This is the distribution of wealth in the United States, or it was uh, a few years ago. Um, we recently passed the 50% mark, where the wealthiest 1% controls 50% of the wealth in the, in the United States. I can't remember if it's the world or the United States. But then there's the world, um, where it's quite similar, where the uh, poorest uh, global citizens have a tiny fraction of global wealth, whereas the wealthiest 1% uh, controls 43% of global wealth. And so this is reflected in the architecture, but the architecture is not just a passive reflection of this condition. It is also an instrument by which this condition is produced, as we saw in Dubai. Uh, it is central to these redistributions because, uh, as you know from other history courses, the uh, basis of wealth, to a large extent, has to do with the control of land and space. And so uh, the, the reason the informal settlements form in cities is to be close to economic opportunities in the formal sector and in the informal sector. So some of the slum alleviation uh, strategies that involve giving people great housing but out of town, uh, people quickly sell off their new beautiful houses and they move back to a similar situation because they need to be close to economic opportunity. So this is a vivid example, a depressing example, of how our struggle to save uh, poor communities through fixing their housing, through architecture, um, actually makes things worse and uh, fails to do anything because the fundamental issues are misunderstood because we are thinking just about architecture. So here's a, a nice building, a um, nice, great place to live. I'd love to have a mini pool on my balcony, and I love the spiral thing, even if it doesn't move. But this is the location of it. That changes everything. Now I don't want to live there. It's not so nice. Um, and it makes a huge difference uh, the way these spatial arrangements uh, operate. Um, which brings us, I hope, very quickly to the next topic, uh, the final topic, which is uh, something that I have really enjoyed looking at because it is such a source of hope. This is Made in Colombia. What do you think of when you hear the word Made in Colombia? Drugs and, uh, you, and death. It turns out it was the murder capital of the world. As a matter of fact, um, more murders per 100,000 people than ever recorded in human history. Um, the deadliest place in the world right now is San Pedro, Honduras, and that's why we have so much pressure on the Mexican borders, is those are the children that are flooding uh, our, our boundaries. Uh, because they're escaping the death. The death toll in San Pedro, Honduras is horrific. 160 murders per year per 100,000 population. In 1991, the U.S. was pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into the uh, war against drugs to capture, what's his name? Pablo Escobar. The United States was also pumping hundreds of billions of dollars into the coffers of Pablo Escobar and the other drug lords of Colombia. So you had hundred billions of dollars going into Colombia every year on two sides of a war. That's the only way you get something like this. Uh, much more dangerous than Kabul, Afghanistan, or Baghdad, Iraq ever were. So you have more people dying. The only reason these kids are here is because their parents and their parents' parents didn't allow them to go to school and made them do their homework under the bed. 
<clears throat> so in facing this crisis, Sergio Fajardo ran for mayor. He was a mathematician, got his PhD from the University of Wisconsin, never held public office. Okay. We're in overtime. Um, but I was told we have really until 12.30 or at least 12.25. Is that right? Is that just getting calibrated? <clears throat> so he ran for mayor. He said, I will stop the stealing. No more corruption. That turned out to be central. But the big thing he said is, I'm going to create opportunity for uh, children and as the military of Colombia start to triumph and declare victory over the drug lords, which they did, so that was a military victory, um, the drug warriors who left Medellin with a fourth grade education, they are flooding back at the, in 2004 when Sergio Fajardo is elected mayor. These drug warriors are flooding back. They're really bad at math. They're really bad at everything except for one thing that they are the world's foremost experts on, which is how to use that AK-47 that they have wrapped up in their duffel bag. And they come home, and what are the opportunities provided by the city of Medellin? Not much. So he says, we got to change that. You turn in your gun, we'll give you an education. And so that's what they do. And they uh, have a competition a global design competition to build uh, world-class architecture and put it in the communities uh, of greatest need and greatest despair. And so they, they look at these maps, they look at where the most murders are, they look at Pablo Escobar's former stronghold and the dark areas, and they say, where are things the worst? And uh, they do that, they uh, they pick a spot where the bodies used to pile up. This is where the most bodies were, were found during uh, the drug wars. And they uh, relocate a few of the buildings. Not many of them were occupied. And they build uh, this. And not my favorite building in the world, but um, uh, it does the trick. It does it by symbolizing what it symbolizes, which is hope. And it does it in a very dramatic way, given its sight. And it does it in a very dramatic way in terms of what it does inside. So this is what actually happens inside. It's called a library park, but it is so much more than either a park or a library. It is a community center. They looked at the housing and they said, you know what, the houses are fine. We're just going to leave the houses. We're not going to touch the houses uh, unless the ones we have to relocate. But we're going to give people what they need. We're going to ask them what they, what they need, and we're going to give it to them. And we're going to give it to them in, uh, in, a, in a way that gives them some dignity and allows them to have pride in their community. And so this is the King of Spain Library Park that has turned everything around. Um, it's connected to the rest of the city, remember, connection to economic opportunities, with a ski lift. This is the same ski lift that I was riding in Zermatt last year. And I went to Medellin um, for the third time, but I, went, I took my family, we, we moved here. We lived here for four months. And when we go over the little pulleys, I have this, like, it is the exact same piece of machinery as I was riding at one of the most expensive ski resorts in the world, and here uh, offered to the slum dwellers of this neighborhood. And the neighborhood around it has become quite vibrant. The gangs are still there, but it's under control. Now, as much as I don't like the architecture of the King of Spain Library, this is uh, a second one they did. There's the King of Spain Library across the valley, up there on the top. But this library, Park uh, is more open. It's not a foreboding Darth Vader box, sealed box. It is an open uh, plaza. It's connected to the neighborhood in a wonderful way. Um, and uh, you, it's almost, you're almost, it's hard to find the interior because there's really this open plaza. 
The people use it as their living room. They hang out, the children play, and it's a wonderful, vibrant place. Um, and this, the situation of these projects, so they did the King of Spain, they did the Quintana project, they did five. Sergio Fajardo, uh, he was limited to a four-year uh, term. Uh, he, did it, he did five of them in four years. He built or renovated 120 schools. Um, a lot of people are telling the story, especially architectural historians, um, that architecture saved the city. But it was a program of the arts, Botero Sculptures uh, downtown, um, a, a library or a, a science museum, exploratorium style science museum, a beautiful botanical garden with these amazing structures um, in the north part of the town where the most murders were being committed. They have this beautiful botanical garden full of life uh, and activity. Um, the escalators of um, the Comuna 13. Um, I'm still not a very good drone pilot, so this didn't turn out that well. Um, but it's hard to photograph it uh, effectively because it's in the slums. It's an escalator so that people can get from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill. It's connected by a linear path from the bottom of the escalator to a library park and to a second metro cable uh, gondola uh, and a beautiful state-of-the-art subway system, the first subway system um, metro train in Latin America. And it's resulted in a remarkable transformation of the neighborhood uh, and of these poorest neighborhoods and the society. And so just to um, cap it off, uh, if the mayor, who is the son of an architect, Mayor Sergio Fajardo, if he had taken the approach that architecture will save the people, it would have failed. Because architecture on its own is not enough. Uh, and I went into this research project looking for what architecture can do. And what he immediately told us, uh, and tells us often, um, is that architecture is a vehicle by which other things happen. And so that's kind of the punchline of these four examples. And I think in a certain way of the course, that if you look at architecture on its own, you're missing an awful lot. No one loves architecture on its own more than me. I went to an art architecture as an art training program uh, to become an architect, but it's just not enough to account for, uh, to really effectively answer the question, what's up with that? So in order to really figure out what's up with that, you have to go way beyond the architecture. You have to start and end with the architecture, but you have to look at the other things that are going on. What are the forces that are operating through the physical built environment and the landscapes and the cities? And how are they operating? How does the design of architecture channel forces in one way or another? Whether it's this lecture hall and your educations, or uh, the, the future of the world uh, when it, as it hits 10 billion. Um, so we're going to stop there.